to jump into the technology and economics of Bitcoin. Overall, this presentation is going to cover the technology of Bitcoin a little more in depth from a higher level overview. Uh, there's no way that we're going to be able to uh, go over everything there is technically with Bitcoin as it takes a very long time to go through all of that. And I don't even understand everything about it myself. But we're also going to talk about the economics of Bitcoin and how I believe that Bitcoin can be seen as sound and hard money and a very good long-term opportunity for everyone. Uh, so really today I'm going to get into the depths of um, just helping you understand uh, how Bitcoin works in the background uh, from the user interface side. But we're going to walk through a real demo of how a Bitcoin transaction works, uh, how you would do that yourself. And honestly, it's it's pretty simple today to do that these types of things. But on the economic side, uh, I will be just going over a lot of charts and uh, use cases of Bitcoin uh, and the game theory and incentive behind it. So... Jumping into the presentation, uh, learning equals time plus energy, and we can describe this as proof of work. So technology throughout the years has changed in many different ways. Uh, in a world where information can be shared with ease and there is new information being produced every single day, it can be very overwhelming for anyone uh, because there is always something new to learn about or there's always something else going on in the world to hear about. If there's one thing that I've noticed in history and also just going through my life is that it seems humans do tend to be good at resisting change. And this can be for either the better or the worse. What I do not want anyone to do though for uh, Bitcoin or any of this type of technology is to really fear it um, or think it's way too difficult to understand. Yes, I know it can appear that way and that's very understandable. I mean, this is a very new technology. Uh, however, depending on the depth that you want to go into really any given technology, there are always going to be different levels of understanding to that given technology. Humans are also pretty good at taking things for granted and not really appreciating the work and effort that goes into the technology that we use in our daily life. But there isn't necessarily anything wrong with that. It's why we have specialization in the first place. So some people are definitely better at some things than others, and that is completely okay. I am not a rocket scientist, so I'm not going to be as good as Elon Musk is at making a rocket go to Mars, right? But I at least understand the things that I do uh, well, and I want to be able to uh, do my work well. Not everyone can be an expert in everything, and I believe that it shows a lot of humility in admitting you don't know things. but you can at least appreciate the people who have done a lot of that heavy lifting for you so that you can have convenience in your life. If we think about the technology of a car, I'd say that a car is a pretty convenient technology, especially for Americans as a, it, it is a uh, main method of travel uh, within the United States. There have been a lot of engineering feats that have gone into making a car. Now, I use a car and I have taken the time to understand a high-level overview of how a car works. So I know that I need to check my fluids, I need to make sure my tires uh, are fine. I, I make sure to take care of the car enough to where I don't have to worry about it breaking down on me. But there's absolutely no way that I can tell you how every single part inside of that car works, right? I don't know exactly how an engine works, but that's okay. The time and effort that it would take me to learn how a car works outweighs my convenience of being able to use that car efficiently and spend the scarce time I have to specialize in what I do 
and also become a better steward within my own work for other people. It's a relationship that is circular, circular and it's continuous. It's a give and take uh, in which we share thoughts and ideas by spending time and energy and effort as this proof of work with each other as humans. And all, overall, this makes us more productive. One thing to note about the car, though, is that it did take me time to learn how to drive the car. And really, with anything you want to learn, it is going to take some time and energy to learn how to use it properly. Otherwise, there can be uh, grave consequences. Now, how can this come into play when I apply it to Bitcoin? So Satoshi Nakamoto, for one, did a lot of that heavy lifting for everybody that uses Bitcoin today by literally creating the invention. But he also built on top of decades of research done from others prior, right? We have the invention of TCP IP, which was used for the internet, and then distributed computing. And overall, we got a form of a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer electronic money created by Satoshi. For the early adopters of Bitcoin, a lot of these people were cypherpunks, mathematicians, cryptographers, uh, uh, computer scientists uh, that were experts in what they did, and overall very talented and skilled. They could actually understand the code Satoshi wrote to build on top of that and give us convenience uh, today. So when you go throughout the years, the past 13 years of Bitcoin being a technology, uh, it's, it's amazing to see what it looks like in 2009 versus what it looks like in 2022, right? Nothing has really changed on the background of things, but from a user interface perspective, people have put in that time and effort to make it easier for us to actually use Bitcoin. Today, all I need to know in order to use Bitcoin is how to download an application on my phone, and that is it. But where can we cross this boundary of convenience into a security risk? And this is what I call the consequences of convenience. We can apply the same concept to the internet, where the internet, when it was born, was a fully decentralized place. Anybody could uh, connect to the internet, uh, write a website and have freedom of speech on the internet and there really wasn't any regulation of it uh, but today we think about the internet and it has become a hub of big tech companies that provide online services for you for your convenience however at the expense of our privacy and digital pr footprint they sell that data to make a profit and have no real ownership uh, or you have no real ownership of your data with these big tech companies. So when you think about Google, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, any of these companies, if you hold data on their servers uh, in these cloud-based platforms, you don't actually own your data. And this was a realization that I had roughly about two years ago, is the fact that if your data is not physically present on a property that you own, the government can freely uh, look at any of that data if they want to and ask for it. And that's kind of a scary reality when you think of it, because when you talk about privacy, uh, I, I hear this argument all the time that if you're not doing anything wrong on the internet, then uh, why do I have to worry? Well, you don't also want to have your country or uh, authorities turn into uh communist China, where they have mass surveillance over every single citizen and have used that data all against them, right? And you then end up in an oppressive society and it's uh, overall a dystopia. But because we have privacy, right, I, I can freely uh, take a shower or use my bathroom or just have things in my life that I don't necessarily want others to see all the time. I can have privacy and there's nothing wrong with that. And this is the same thing with the internet. We, we can have privacy and there can be nothing wrong that we're doing, but it's still good that we have privacy. So when I apply this to Bitcoin, uh, we can see that Bitcoin itself as a protocol is fully decentralized. But over time, there have been companies like exchanges, uh, such as Coinbase, that have provided a lot of convenience to the users 
but they don't give them full ownership or control over the Bitcoin a user owns. So I think of places also like Robinhood or uh, these IRA accounts, investment accounts that allow you to buy Bitcoin. Depending on the way they are going about that, most of the time they do not give you the actual access to that Bitcoin. So if the company, the exchange went bankrupt, then you lose all of your Bitcoin. There is no insurance. There is no FDIC to bail them out. So in a similar fashion, you can really think of this uh, as, as the 1800s uh, with bank runs and gold certificates being having too many gold certificates in supply to actually back up the physical gold in the bank vaults. Okay. And we've seen this process repeated over and over and over, and it becomes a security risk. So how can we as users of any technology ensure that we can still use the technology properly with convenience, but ensure that there isn't a security risk? Uh, we have to put in some time and energy into learning how the technology works. And that is what we're going to do today with Bitcoin. So. The big question is, how does Bitcoin work? Uh, and I'm going to start from a more basic understanding of computer science. So as time has gone on, humans have also tried to make our lives easier with inventions um, such as the one on the screen, an abacus, right? And this is probably one of the earliest forms of what you can call a computer. And this isn't really what a computer is. However, it is called a state machine. So a state machine is a machine where you can change its state and it will produce some specific output. Okay. Now, early state machines were all created for specific purposes. So with the abacus, uh, it helped people keep track of numbers very quickly and calculate things quicker. Okay. We aren't going to go into the whole history of computer science. That isn't necessary. However, eventually we got to a point where we could get to what we call a general purpose state machine. And this is a machine that can be programmed to produce a specific output. Now I like Jason Lowry, He's uh, uh, his input on this for programming and computer science. His explanation goes like this. With the introduction of general purpose state machines, you did not need to learn how to build or design the machine anymore, but instead you could come up with the idea and thought and figure out how to program it into the general purpose state machine. If we look at the works of Shakespeare, we can see that he came up with this fictional imaginary story like Romeo and Juliet, but Shakespeare wrote down his thought and idea of this story into a symbolic language that we know as English that could be communicated to the rest of the world. This play of Romeo and Juliet can then be given to an actor to give a performance of that story. And the actor isn't truly Romeo or Juliet in an actress case, but in all reality, Romeo and Juliet uh, do not exist in the actual physical world. However, it can still have an emotional response to whoever views that play. Okay, computer programming is the same thing. A programmer can come up with the idea, represent it in a symbolic language called machine code that a computer can then understand. And when the computer uh, takes in this machine code, the computer just does what the programmer asked it to do. It's not doing anything wrong. The physical state of the computer is not changing uh, or the physical hardware in, in the machine, but all of these different uh, states in the computer from an electrical circuit standpoint are changing which then gives us some output we can understand and this serves just like the actor or actress in Romeo and Juliet. This is really weird to think about because when you look at a computer screen uh, the computer program is not really changing anything in the physical world right uh, so like when I'm on a video call with someone over the computer I'm just looking at a screen with a bunch of light emitting diodes uh, that exist in an, in an array on a plane and that's all I'm looking at. I'm not looking at a physical person. But because of where we are in technology, I can trust that 
we are not looking at a robot, we're not looking at an AI, but we're looking at the actual person in the physical world on this video call, wherever they may be. And this is just pretty mind-blowing that we've been able to come up with this stuff and continue to build on top of it as we go on. Realistically, I don't know if there's any human that could actually explain every single detail inside of a computer today uh, and this is why, I mean, even for computers, there are different specialized parts and all of those parts come together to form uh, the digital computer we know today. So, uh, the reason I'm really saying all of this is really to introduce what computers work on today and what we know as binary. So, binary is just the representation of uh, data in base 2. So there are only two states, 0 being off or on being 1. Okay, In our world uh, of normal numbers, we have base 10, right? We, we number everything from 0 to 9, and there's 10 numbers. Okay, So we call it base 10, there's 10 different states. Uh, the only thing that a computer can understand today is how to represent a symbolic language that we give the computer which then turns into this stream of zeros and ones, uh, and then it represents something back to us, okay? And all of this is just based on changes in electrical circuits, switching states, and voltage. So when we represent this data, just like I said a minute ago, we can represent it in different ways. Um, in base 10 in decimal, we have 84,661. Now, to a computer, they read it this way, uh, in base 2 as binary, and, and there is another one in base 16, so the possibilities are from 0 to 9, and then it, it's A, B, C, D, E, F to represent 16 different possibilities, 16 different states, and we can represent uh, numbers a little more efficiently in hexadecimal by putting it in this base 16 format for human readable standpoint. Uh, so a lot of computer scientists do understand hexadecimal, uh, but nobody really reads binary, only the computers do, okay? The reason that I'm saying all of this is because it is, it is easier for us to represent data in different ways for different reasons, and the main reason we want to represent data differently is in the case of especially cryptography, and cryptography is basically the study and practice of techniques for secure communication in the presence of adversarial behavior. Okay, so imagine we have a sender and receiver in this case on the screen. The sender has some message that's in plain text that anybody in the world can read, say it's in English. They use a key to put it through an encryption algorithm to produce a ciphertext. Now the ciphertext should be something gibberish should not be understandable by anybody. Uh, so if the interceptor tries to read it, they should not be able to actually come up with the original data. The only way that they can is if they had the key that was used to encrypt it, because that same key is gonna be used to decrypt it. So in this case, the receiver is gonna take the same key, put it through, put the message through the decryption algorithm and get the original message back. And this is how the basics of cryptography works. There are two different main types of cryptography. We have symmetric, which is exactly what I just described. And then there's also asymmetric cryptography. And asymmetric cryptography is used a lot in the world for many different reasons, uh, including Bitcoin. But we'll talk about that once we get a little bit more into digital signatures. I want to bring up cryptographic hash functions real quick, because these are very, very important things to at least understand, especially when it comes to Bitcoin, uh, mainly due to the fact that cryptographic hash functions are used everywhere for many different reasons. So in Bitcoin's case, we use a cryptographic hash function called SHA-256, S-H-A-256. And what that represents is that the hash function is going to produce an output of 256 bits. And when I say a bit, a bit is just one of these zeros or ones. Okay, so there's 256 of these. Now, if we take a base two number, okay, 
there's two states and we raise that to the 256, we can see that there is a lot of different possible outputs for that number. Okay, and that's what we rely on inside of the security of cryptographic hash functions and cryptography is using very, very large numbers that are very unpre unpredictable where a computer would take billions or trillions or quadrillion years to even be able to find what that number is okay so for a crypt cryptographic hash function the basic way to describe it is that it is a mathematical function that takes an input of any length and transforms that input to produce a single output that in a fixed length called a digest or a hash so the properties of a uh, cryptographic hash function is that it should be computationally efficient, so it should be very quick in being able to compute what the hash should be from the given input. It should be hard to find two different inputs that map to the same exact output. We call this uh, collision in the hash hashing world. Uh, so a property of a hash function should be that it's collision resistant the bit space should be very, very large to where it's not really possible for it to happen. We should be able to hide information about the input when we look at the output, and the output should look completely random. Okay, so we can look at this, this uh, picture in front of us. So we have Fox as our input, and it's going to output through this hash function some hash on the right. There is no way on the right side that I should be able to tell what the heck the input was from the output. So a hash function is meant to be irreversible. There is no way that I should be able to get back to the input. The only way that I can figure out what the original input was is if I brute forced and kept throwing in different types of input to find the same exact output. And this is exactly what happens when people try to uh, crack your passwords if they steal them from uh, some companies. They try to figure out what input maps to the output that they have because hashes should be stored in your database as your password. Uh, and then that that is compared to when you log into a uh, website. Now, if I go down, we see the red fox jumps over the blue dog, and that's going to produce this output. Now, one more on the third line, we had the same exact input, except instead of over, it's over. We change one letter, and the hash looks completely different on the right side. Okay. And then, of course, we can keep doing this over and over again, and it should look very different. So... A more simple approach to this is, say I had a given input, and right now I'm applying no hash and hash function to my name right now. However, if I use Bitcoin as SHA-256, this is always going to be the same for this given input. So my name maps to this output always, no matter what website, no matter what computer I'm using. If I'm using SHA-256, this is always going to be the output, okay? As soon as I change this, this input, I can change one letter, S-E-R, this output is completely different than before, okay? And this is very important for us because, like I said, it gives us a sense of security for our passwords, but also it's used for data integrity. And I can continue to increase the input size of this much larger than the output size of 256 bits which maps to 32 bytes and a bit like i said is either a zero or a one but eight of those bits equals one byte okay so 256 bits maps out to 32 bytes and I'm currently writing 125 bytes to the screen as my input, and we always get this fixed length output, okay? So that's the basics of a hash function. Now, why is this important? Because when we get to the world of digital signatures in asymmetric cryptography, we use hash functions 
to uh, provide us data integrity and also help uh, the signing uh, of a digital signature be computationally efficient, okay? So what is a digital signature exactly? So let's, let's just walk through this. A digital signature is basically the same form of a physical signature in the digital world, okay? So when I write on a document, and we have some data on this document, whatever it is, say it's some title to a house, I can then sign my name and whatever, and that is my physical signature, right? Now, the one difference that I will explain in just a minute is that in the case I change this signature to something else, the original data of this title on the paper does not change. However, in the digital signature world, it will change. The signed data will change. So let's go through an, an example of how exactly a digital signature works. So when we create digital signatures, this is all based on public and private key cryptography. So asymmetric cryptography. So we can generate a key sub s, which is going to be our private key, okay? And this will be our little legend over here. We can also generate a verification key called our public key. So anyone can know the public key, but only you should know the private key, okay? So then we have a message, and this message can be anything of any length. And then we have the signed message, which is used in our digital signature world to prove ownership, and we'll explain that in just a minute. And then we have a message hash. And we won't use this yet, but we'll use it in a few minutes. Okay. So when I want to send a message to somebody, I can prove that I am the one that signed that message by sending a person the original message, the signed message, and then my public key. Because this public key and private key have a mathematical relationship. These two are tied together in such a way that they cannot be broken, okay? So just think that they're married to each other or something, all right? So when I sign a message, I can take my message and I can then apply the signing key, which only I know, to produce the signed message, okay? Now, when the receiver receives this message, they can put it through a verify function, and they can take the original message I sent, they can take the signed message, which comes from the private key, and then they can take my verification key, the public key, to then give two possible outputs. This is going to be either true or false. If it is false, that means that I, with the public key that I gave, that signed message does not mathematically link to the private key, okay, that uh, matches the public key that I gave a person. So that means that I did not actually sign this message and I do not have ownership of that message. So this is uh, a way very easily that people can verify either true that yes yes I signed it or no uh, I did not sign it okay and this verify function is very quick very computationally efficient and uh, it's easy for anyone to be able to verify. Now, if I change the private key at all, this 
k sub s to produce m of s, m of s will change if I change k sub s. And if I change the message in any way, m of m sub s will also change, okay? Now, where we bring in hashing into this is that we can take some message and apply, apply a SHA-256 hash on M to produce M of H. And then M of H can then be used inside of our sign and verify. Okay, so this gives us some data integrity because if we're using a hash function that is good and it is secure, uh, there isn't going to be collision resistance, we can ensure that there is no other input that will map to this same exact hash. So I should never have a message that says hello, and then I should never says, have a message that says goodbye lead to the same exact hash, okay? So this should not happen. And as long as we are using a secure function like SHA-256, we can ensure that this will remain true, okay? So where does this come in when we talk about uh, Bitcoin? So we are now going to start getting into how Bitcoin actually works, okay? But before I get into uh, Bitcoin specifically uh, with how it works, uh, I just want to explain the problems that Satoshi solved and go through how Satoshi basically built Bitcoin, okay? So we'll come back to digital signatures in a few minutes. So Satoshi tackled a lot of problems. He tackled uh, how to create a peer-to-peer -peer network that allows anyone to voluntarily join and participate or leave. He solved how a group of people that don't have to reveal their identities or trust to each other can maintain a shared ledger of value, even if some of them are dishonest. And then also, he figured out how to allow people to issue their own unforgeable currency without relying on a central issuer while maintaining the scarcity of that currency so that production of new units isn't a free-for-all. In the beginning of Bitcoin, most people thought it was a joke, and there were very few nodes, and we'll talk about what a node is in a minute, very few computers that ran Bitcoin's code on the network. However, a decade later, 13 years later, it is used by over 100 million people today, with tens to hundreds of thousands of nodes running the Bitcoin software, which is developed and maintained by hundreds of uh, or thousands of volunteers and companies worldwide, okay? So Bitcoin does not need to rely on this trust. If we remember, we when we talked about Bitcoin, Bitcoin is completely peer-to-peer, -peer, okay? So when we think of a bank, and I will use this as my bank, the banks normally serve as these middlemen between any transaction. So I could be the consumer, and then I could also have the merchant over here. And what happens is that when I pay the merchant, I will contact my bank, my bank will contact their bank, and then they will give the money to the merchant. Now, this all takes roughly, uh, roughly about one, one month to fully settle everything, okay? And this can go over a card network like Visa, and overall this is where the uh, percentage percentages of using card networks comes in. So a bank will be like, okay, yeah, I'll take a 1% fee. The Visa network will take a 1% fee. And then the other merchant banks like, well, I don't wanna be left out, I'll take a 1% fee. So overall the merchant possibly loses if you're using some credit card, um, possibly up, up to around 3%. 3% loss using cards, okay? Now, Bitcoin gets rid of all of this by just saying we have Alice over here, 
and we have Bob over here. And Alice directly sends uh, Bitcoin to Bob, okay? So we'll say A and B. And they don't have to go through this cloud of banking infrastructure, okay? They can avoid all of this and just directly uh, send money to each other, okay? So how did Satoshi get rid of this? So we know that banks basically hold ledger entries with each other, and these ledger entries uh, contain, okay, A sent money to Bob, Bob sent money to Charlie, uh, and then the other bank over here will tend to copy that ledger, or at least see and communicate that as A sent money to B and B sent money to C, okay? So how can we distribute this ledger properly? Okay, distributed ledgers. If we don't have one central ledger, it must be the case that the ledger now belongs to the people, okay? So this gives us a network effect. Everyone can acknowledge and verify and write uh, the entries into their own ledger, all right? So let's create an example of a ledger system where it is distributed amongst a few people. So let's say that A holds some ledger entry and they can communicate it with B, but also there is C, okay? So if, I, if A sent money to B, B should copy A sent money to B and then they will be able to have that money. And then C should also copy that A sent money to B. They all have this relationship with each other, okay? They're all linked. Now, everyone records these transactions, uh, and since the ledger is no longer in one place, we can call it distributed. And because there's no central server or party in charge, we tend to call this possibly decentralized. However, uh, that's not always the case. The system has to be consensus-based because it relies on everyone agreeing on a particular version of the truth. Uh, everyone can come together to verify that money cannot be double-spent according to the ownership and transfer of funds. Okay, As long as our distributed ledger requires permission to join and we can trust every party to be honest, the system will work but this does not actually play out well in the real world, right? Distributed systems made of arbitrary participants are inherently unreliable and dishonest. Some may go offline, so say B went offline, now there's only trust between A and C, but if A and, A and B went offline, then C is the only holder of that ledger, and they can then enter anything they want into the ledger, possibly committing fraud. Because as soon as A comes back online, anything that C entered into the network, say that they just entered that A sent money to C, A is going to copy that when they come back online. And even though A did not approve of that, okay, but because they have to download each other's ledgers, they will form this consensus model. And this can uh, prove some dishonesty, okay? And there is overall a consensus failure. So... Let's go over the example of a double spend attack. So the big problem with the double spend is the fact that in a distributed ledger, we have to figure out how, a, how everyone can make sure that a double spend does not happen. Okay, so let's say, let's say that on the network, um, Alice, Alice wants to buy something from C, from Charlie, and they record in their ledger that they sent something to Charlie. However, however, what if they also simultaneously said, oh, I'll just send money to myself with the same exact transaction, okay? What will happen, what will happen is that now we have a conflict of transactions in the ledger if these two are the same transaction input going to different transaction outputs. Now, what could happen in this case is that 
Alice, Alice could coerce Bob, coerce Bob to only record this transaction in the ledger. So Bob will just put this, right? But because Charlie saw this transaction first, Charlie will say, oh, cool, I received money. Awesome. However, however, because Alice and Bob are colluding with each other, they hold the majority majority uh, of the ledger, okay? So if Alice then deletes this transaction and Bob and Alice, if Charlie paid Alice already and gave the product to uh, Alice, Charlie is then going to download these two ledgers because they are the majority, and then this will turn from A to A. Okay, and this is where we have our double spend attack because they spent the same exact transaction twice and colluded with each other, uh, and this overall causes a consensus failure. The majority of the network always wins and determines what is true. If we want to make a permissionless system where anyone can participate without asking, then it also must be resilient to dishonest actors. Okay, so this is where Satoshi Nakamoto solved the Byzantine general's problem. And I can't remember if I have a picture of that somewhere. Uh, yeah, right here. So the Byzantine general's problem is basically a problem where every single general around a city has to agree with each other in order to take the city down. However, if, if one of them is dishonest, then they will... Uh, not take down the city and the other general's armies will fail. Okay, so how can we create this solution to solve the Byzantine general's problem? So a naive solution is to simply apply, appoint honest ledger keepers. So let's say that we appoint it A, B, C, and D. Okay, and they all have their own ledger entries. This leads to overall a centralized system because now there's only four computers worldwide. There's only four computers that hold the ledger overall. And let me write this out. Consensus. Okay. So if in the case, let's say that these were all honest ledger keepers. Even if A, B, C, and D were honest, the government, the government can show up to their doorstep or some uh, authoritative regime, and they can take down the entire network. Uh, and then, because the network is only between A, B, C, and D, there is not the people, the people outside do not have any record of the ledger. Okay, all of it is a permissioned, honest appointed system um, but the government has taken it down and it failed okay this was the case with bitgold now uh, instead of a full shutdown the government could also coerce people uh, into accepting certain transactions or denying certain transactions so let's say that Charlie Charlie is coerced by the government with bribe or some person or rich rich guy right Charlie now is going to adhere, adhere to government regulation, right? So let's say that Alice, Bob, and uh, Dave do not really care about what transactions are relayed across the network. However, C, Charlie, is going to stop any transaction of where, okay, uh, this person uh, likes ice cream, well, any person that likes ice cream can now not commit a transaction to the network, right? So if the government was able to coerce through either bribery or some person was able to coerce these people through violence, if they controlled three of these, Alice is still the honest person, okay? If they coerce the three people, Bob, Charlie, and Dave, then the majority of the network is now held under regulation, right? And compliance of whoever doesn't, or whoever likes ice cream cannot tr commit transactions to the network, okay? And this can be applied in any case of 
political belief or a religious belief or anything. And this system fails, okay? So what if we appointed a democracy? Um, so we found a poll of 50 honest people and we run elections every single day to keep rotating who gets the right uh, entries into the ledger. So what if instead we voted for Alice to stay there? We voted for Bob and Charlie and Dave to stay there, right? And a bunch of different people. This system will work great until people then still show up and do this, right? Because overall, in the end, uh, if, if your identity is found if alice's identity is found by the government then they could be completely coerced or shut down right so anytime we appoint specific people to maintain this ledger they must be trusted to be honest and we have no way of defending them from being coerced like bob and charlie and dave cannot defend alice at all all right now we also we whenever we assume trust based on identity we give ourselves up to what is called a civil attack. And this is spelled like so. Civil attack. So this is basically an attack based on an imperson impersonation... Ah, gosh. Impersonation of someone you trust. It is imperative that we prevent the people who get to keep our ledger for us from being coerced in any way. Okay? So how did Satoshi solve this overall? Well, Satoshi wanted a system where anybody could participate, right? And allowed anybody to join this network. So instead of allowing violence, personal identity, bribery, coercion to happen, we just open it up to the entire network. We allow anyone, anyone can keep the ledger there is no permission of who and who can and cannot but what if what if we picked someone at random to write the ledger every single time so ran randomize uh ledger entry okay so this is basically a lottery uh also what we call proof of work and we'll get to what proof of work is in a minute okay so when we want to send money we announce to the entire network uh, all transactions are announced across the network okay and this is basically the same thing as before, but instead of having everyone write down the transactions, we use the lottery to allow one person uh, to win this right to enter the transactions into the ledger. When we select a winner, the person then gets to write all of the transactions that they heard about uh, into the ledger. If the person writes invalid transactions, invalid transactions, and I'm going to shorten that up to TXS. Uh, invalid transactions are not permitted to the ledger. So these can be like double spins or you're spending too much than you actually have. And all of this is verified and enforced. All verified and enforced by uh, the ledger keepers. So they verify that all transactions that it is permitted to be written to the ledger has to be verifiable. And due to this, due to this, the person that also gets to write um, who wins the lottery, uh, lottery winner, gets a reward and a fee okay 
Now the fee comes from the people that want to write ledgers or transactions into the ledger and they pay the lottery winner a little bit of a fee for their work that they're putting in. So we basically wait for a while so that most people have time to update their ledger entry because um, writing a ledger, writing a ledger across thousands of people takes time, right? Then we run the lottery again. Okay, so these are the basic rules of how Bitcoin works. And this was the system that Satoshi designed. Okay, so how does, how does all of this actually work? Uh, so proof of work, let's talk about proof of work real quick. So there's two questions that arise with proof of work. Who will sell the tickets to the lottery and pick the winning numbers if we have already determined that we can't have a central trusted party, right? How do we also ensure that the winner of the lottery actually writes good transactions into the ledger rather than trying to cheat the rest of us? Uh, we have to make the system trustless. So this has to be trustless uh, and also permissionless. So it must be possible for everyone to generate their own lottery ticket. So all people can generate a lottery ticket. We must have some way to make playing the lottery actually cost something. So there has to be real world cost to playing the lottery, right? And we've, if we think about this in the real world, I mean, if you play a lottery, it, it's going to cost you money to actually generate a ticket, right? And this is, in Bitcoin's case, where electricity comes in. Electricity and SHA-256, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little more in a bit uh, once we get to Bitcoin's proof of work. But it also must be easy, easy for all to verify the solution uh, ticket, okay? So if someone generates their own ticket and then they find that their ticket works, they propose that to the network and the entire network can then easily check that that is the solution to the problem. So this is where uh, physics plays into Bitcoin. So proof of work was originally designed in 1993 by Adam Back with, uh, I think I spelled his name right, Adam Back with Hashcash. Okay. And this was actually meant to serve as a denial of service uh, protection for emails, right? But then Satoshi took this idea and applied it to Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, Bitcoin's proof of work uses the first law of thermodynamics. Okay. And says that neither energy, uh, says that energy can neither be created or, nor destroyed, right? Energy cannot be created nor destroyed, only transferred, right? So electricity has always been pretty expensive because you have to purchase it from power producers uh, or run your own power plant, right? The concept behind proof of work is that you participate in a random process similar to basically rolling a die, but instead of the six-sided die, this one has about as many sides as atoms in the universe, okay? To win the lottery, 
you must produce a number which is mathematically derived from the transactions you want to write into the ledger plus the value of the die you rolled. You could roll quadrillions of times and still not get the answer, okay? So basic checks that need to be performed if you have the winning number is, is the number you provided less than a target number range everyone agreed upon ahead of time? Is the number indeed mathematically derived from a valid set of transactions, all verified and uh, usable transactions that you want to write into the ledger? Uh, and do all of these transactions play by the rules? No double spending, no generating new Bitcoin outside of the allowed schedule. Proof of work is a random chance process that requires many computa computations to find a winning number. However, it only takes one single operation to verify the solution. So we can think of Sudoku, right? Sudoku, to solve a puzzle takes a lot of time. Right? But anyone, anyone can verify quickly right, the solution. So if you propose a solution, they can easily verify uh, much quicker than it would take to actually solve that puzzle. So it's hard for the players of the lottery, but it's easy for the validators. Because you have to put in a lot of energy and therefore money into this lottery you want everyone to accept uh, your winning lottery ticket. You become incentivized too. This is the game theory that's at play. You are incentivized to behave well by writing only valid transactions into the ledger because you are using real world cost. It, it costs real world money to actually be able to uh, get Bitcoin reward, okay? So, now that we've gone over that, let's actually go over exactly how a Bitcoin transaction in its entirety works. Okay, so I'm going to pull up real quick. We'll, we'll go back uh, right here. We're not going to talk about a blockchain yet. Um, on my website, uh, I have a place where I can enter an input to pay me in Bitcoin. Okay, so. I have multiple Bitcoin wallets there. Uh, I mean, overall, I, I have plenty of ways to pay myself in Bitcoin. So I will say $10 and I will say pay. Okay. Now, my website will generate a QR code. And on my phone that I have pulled up, I will be able to open my camera and go up to my screen and scan the QR code, okay? So this QR code, I can verify real quick that the address is correct by looking at the Q5GY, and that is, uh, or sorry, not Q5, G85GY, okay? And I can say this is demo. So I'm gonna send with a network fee of very, very small amount of Bitcoin, 379 sats, um, confirm that fee and send it, okay? So now I have this Bitcoin transaction uh, broadcasted to the network, okay? And this is gonna pull up on my screen. So now, now I can see that my transaction is sitting over here on the left in this unconfirmed block. Okay, and we'll get, we'll get to exactly how that worked. So what just happened in the background? Okay, so let's, let's go through this. Let's say that I'm, we have a Bitcoin transaction. Okay, so in Bitcoin, when we come back to digital signatures, our public key can derive many addresses, okay? And these are what we use as short form ways to find uh, the payment for the public key uh, that somebody wants to use. And so we can have a public key mapped to many addresses. Now the private key, the private key 
is going to sign the transaction and we'll call this TX okay so I'll make another legend up here real quick just to ensure that we have all of this down so we have K of S K of V um, for a public key private key pub key uh, message is going to be our transaction uh, signed message is going to be our signed transaction so transaction signed TX okay and then uh, let's see our addresses yeah okay so let's say that before somebody in the world uh, we'll say that Alice Alice sent me some Bitcoin from before. Alice and Bob. So Alice sent me, uh, we'll say in this transaction, sent me one Bitcoin, okay? And Bob also sent me uh, one Bitcoin, right? Now, what I just did, I paid myself, okay? So I, I have an output uh, now where my output I'm going to take I'm going to take my public key and I'm going to derive my address okay so this will be Bailey I just paid myself right Bailey is going to get uh, and we'll say address Bailey is going to get a certain amount of Bitcoin one second I'll move this over here so let's say in this in this scenario that I actually sent one Bitcoin to myself now I didn't just do that but let's just say I sent one Bitcoin all right so in this case um, Alice is gonna I'm gonna use Alice's transaction as my first input and then I'm also gonna use Bob's transaction as my second input and then I can hash this with SHA-256 to one, make the transaction a bit smaller so I don't have all the details of the transaction into a digest. Okay, we'll call this D1 and D2. So the D1 and D2 will then serve for my output and I'll indicate this by 0, 1, 0, 2, and 0, 3. Okay. Now, let's say that in this transaction, I also wanted to build out a way to pay somebody else, okay? So, I paid myself, I paid myself one Bitcoin, right? So, this will go to my address. Now, what if I wanted to send Charlie uh, 0.25 Bitcoin, right? Charlie... And then over here, we will use 0.75 Bitcoin for the proof of work fee, okay? So realistically, realistically, the proof of work fee is not going to be this much. This is going to go to some minor address. But this is going to be Charlie's address right here, okay? So overall, we have on the input side, we have two Bitcoin. And on the output side, we also have two Bitcoin. So these two have to match up in this transaction because, because one, I can use this D2, this input two, as my output three, right? I'm sending one Bitcoin to one Bitcoin, right? Then on the other side, on the other side, for Alice, I need to split this transaction up, okay? Using this same transaction for the Charlie address and then the proof of work fee, okay? And you can think of this as, say I'm trying to split a $100 bill in, in D1's case. The $100 bill has to split up, obviously, into change and uh, be able to split into different places it can go right so if I'm trying to pay Charlie and I'm also trying to pay the fee then that needs to add up obviously to my $100 all 
Uh, so in this case, it's one Bitcoin. So 0 0.25 and 0 0.75 add up together to make one. All right. So now we have this built out transaction. I'm paying a total of one Bitcoin. I, I input two. I pay one. And I also get change of one Bitcoin. Okay, so now I have this built out transaction. Okay, now with this transaction, what I can do is I can take the entire transaction and use apply my private key to the transaction. And then this is going to give me a signed transaction signature saying that I built the transaction and I have the private key right mapping to the public keys the addresses that I have I have all of this sign and I append it to this transaction so now the transaction will also include my signed TX signature and this is a built transaction so from here all of this turns into an easy little signed transaction okay now this signed transaction is then going to be broadcasted out by a Bitcoin node so we need to broadcast this so Bitcoin nodes are basically the computers that actually run Bitcoin's code they are the ones that hold the ledger so this node is going to look look at my transaction if it follows the rules then it's good to go okay and when it checks very easily it's very quick to verify this it will then relay this relay the TX across the entire network and then once it reaches this point, the network will all verify, all verify the TX, okay? Every single computer on the entire Bitcoin network will verify this and then put it into what we call the memory pool, okay? Now this memory pool uh, is just the place where transactions go to be put into the ledger okay so when we look at the memory pool we have this uh, let me redraw this we have a mempool for short we have a bunch of transactions just sitting in this memory pool in random places okay so what then happens is that a bitcoin miner this is the lottery game a Bitcoin miner and this is just a computer it's not a person this computer will take out transactions and form it into a list okay so we'll just call this our TX list so it has TX1 TX2 to TX of N and it will then put the transaction list through a SHA-256 function to be output into what is called a Merkle root hash okay so this is the job of some Bitcoin miners not every single Bitcoin miner depending on its strength does the same thing some of them all just try to form a transaction list and output it into the Smirkle root hash. Now the reason this is important is because this is used inside of a block. So what is a block? This is where we're going to start talking about a blockchain structure. So a blockchain is basically a database. That is all it is. And a database is a place where you can store data and query that data very efficiently and quickly. However, in blockchain's case, it's really not that efficient, okay? So 
the how a blockchain is basically formed is is that you have a block and this block has specific data at certain offsets. So we have, say, a version. We have uh, the previous block hash. We'll talk about what that is. We have the Merkle root, which we just used. Then we have some difficulty. Then we have a random number. And then we also do include um, the transaction list. Okay. But that's not in its full entirety. Uh, this transaction list is dwindled down a little bit. Okay. So, inside of block, let's call this block one, we have this data. Now, this data and everything, what a Bitcoin miner will do is once they have made this transaction list and they put all the transactions into SHA-256 in the Merkle root hash, they will then take this entire thing and they will put this through SHA-256 again to form uh, a possible solution. So this possible solution has to agree with the entire network. And I, I will rewrite this out real quick just to show you how this works. Okay, so let's say that this possible solution, uh, we have a block, we have SHA-256, and we have the entire block data. This will produce some value, some 256-bit value, or 32 bytes. Okay, 256 divided by 8 is 32. Now, this number is compared to value is compared to a target. Now, for a solution to be correct, the value has to be less than the target. If the value is above the target, and this target is agreed on by the entire network, it will be invalidated if it is above the target. Now, I don't know which one it is if it's equal to, but in this case, we'll just say that it's less than or equal to the target. Okay. Um, in this example, let's say that in the SHA-256, we produce some number of value as 1,000. And let's just say our target is 2,000. 1,000 is less than 2,000, so this checks out. Now, if the value, if the value is not that, but instead it's say 3,000, then this does not work, and it is not a valid block solution. Okay, so that is entirely how how Bitcoin mining works. And these Bitcoin miners, they do the SHA-256 function at um, quintillion times per second. Uh, I think it's 236 quintillion times per second. Uh, that's how quick um, this network is and how strong the network is. Okay, so that's what a Bitcoin miner does. But... How do we form a blockchain, okay? So once the miner finds a valid solution, for one, the miner is rewarded uh, any of the transaction fees that were included in the transactions and also a block reward, okay? And we'll talk about that more later on, the block reward. But like I said, this is the important thing, the previous block hash. So the previous block hash is going to be the hash of what is the previous block. And we always start at block zero. This is the Genesis block. Okay. Now the Genesis block does not have a previous block hash. Uh, 
because obviously it is the first block, so it is statically set in the code. Statically set uh, previous BLK hash. And this number, I believe, in the Genesis block for Bitcoin is actually just zero. So it takes this data and then it will go through SHA-256 to produce some valid solution. And then this valid solution is then put into the next block, okay? And this is where we start to get our chain. So in this scenario, this will also go through 256, SHA-256, produce some valid solution. And then this will be included in block two, okay? Now the reason this is important is because this gives the entire network some integrity, okay? Now, one thing I wanna clarify real quick is that this does not give it immutability, okay? It's meant for integrity only. Immutability comes in because of decentralization. So a blockchain, a blockchain is just a chain of blocks and the property is not that it's inherently immutable. The immutability Immutability comes from decentralization. And also uh, consensus. Okay, and then it is meant to have some form of integrity. However, this integrity can be broken. So for an example, let's say that I started up Bailey coin, okay? And this can be some random blockchain that is created on top of some other blockchain, whatever, say Ethereum or something, or I fork it off and create my own uh, chain. Uh, so what happens with this is Say that I am the sole owner of the blockchain. So Bailey owns the entire blockchain. Okay. I own the entire blockchain. Then I am also the only person, the only person that has access to this blockchain too. So say I have this blockchain built up when we have a blockchain normally the reason we know that this has integrity is that if if one bit of data if one bit of data changes inside of this block these blocks are now invalidated because the hash the hash of this block changes okay and then because this hash is stored in here this hash is stored in here all of those hashes also have to change, okay? But because I am the sole owner of this blockchain, what I can do is I can create, I can create an entire blockchain of transactions uh, and have no difficulty involved in hashing all of those transactions. And I can immediately create this out of thin air, okay? So say that in the ledger entry, I have A sends money to B, B sends money to C, and then let's say that I want everyone to then send money to me. But in this record, we just have a bunch of transactions um, being sent out and whatever, okay? But let's say from right here, I want to propose because I own the entire chain, but people are using my blockchain. In the next block, what I could do is I could automatically just write that Alice sent money to me, B sent money to me, 
C sent money to me, and so on, right? And all of the network, all of the network, because it belongs to me, I get all the money, right? So this is not immutable. Because I can change whatever I want. This just becomes a normal database at this point. Okay? There is no true integrity to this blockchain. Okay. So that's very important to understand because this immutability word with blockchains is thrown around a lot. And it's not necessarily true. This can even be the case when there are only, say, five people in the network. Right? We go back to... Uh, Let's go back to the not proof of work. We go back to this problem of double spending and then coercion, right? Say Amazon owns all three of these uh, data points. Amazon can write anything they want into the blockchain and it will be considered truth, okay? And that's the problem with. Um, this characteristic that is thrown around with immutability is that immutability comes from the de decentralization. If there is centralization, immu immutability goes out the window, and you also have to have consensus on the network, okay? So why Bitcoin works in this case is because Bitcoin, Bitcoin has pure decentralization by allowing everyone to run a node, okay? So there's thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of nodes, okay? So the ledger, the ledger is spread across thousands of people. Then the nodes do not get to, do not get to uh, enter ledger entries or enter transactions to ledger. So this process is split up between the miners, and there's also thousands of miners. These miners compete in this lottery system to enter transactions into the ledger. Okay, This is how Bitcoin solves decentralization and consensus. It, allow, it is completely permissionless. Nobody has to give up their identity or anything to be able to participate in the network and they can also opt out. And Bitcoin has pure integrity with its blockchain and we can know that this is the most secure blockchain ever created because, because currently right now, uh, to perform a double spin attack, you would need to have around the theoretical 51% of the blockchain. So currently, a 51% attack costs around $1 million per hour. Okay, So for you to be able to commit a double spend attack, one, if you're trying to double spend less than a $1 million, it's not worth it because you're losing money as a Bitcoin miner if you coerce 51% uh, of the network. Okay. Now, also, if we think about this, to, to overtake 51% of the hash power, you have to have Bitcoin miners. So you can't just have energy. You can have unlimited energy, but this energy has to go through SHA-256 as encrypted energy. Which then, which then allows uh, for hash power on the network. Okay. So because of this, you have to have Bitcoin miners, and for you to be able to allocate fifty-one percent of the hash rate, which is currently around two hundred sixty-three exahashes per second, for me to let's just use easy, easy numbers, um, or rather this split in half divided by two is uh, 130, uh, 1.5. <clears throat> if I split this up, for me to get 131 exahashes per second worth of hardware, this is gonna cost me around, uh, if I remember correctly, 
20 billion dollars of miners so of actual hardware equipment but also to produce 20 billion dollars of these miners the manufacturing isn't there right for me to produce that many miners instantly or uh, over time, it takes a lot of time to actually produce that amount of miners. And I believe if I calculated this right, I believe to take over 100% of the Bitcoin network of hash rate, you have to, one second, you have to get 2 million, 630,000 100 terahash machines okay to accumulate 100% of the network currently okay and even if you had this it would still take around 800 days if you had 100% of the hash power to rebuild the entire chain. So you would have to basically stop time and hope that nobody else on the network starts mining in order to reproduce the entire chain, okay? So this is why Bitcoin is very secure because it's theoretically impossible for anyone to get the amount of hardware needed to attack the network. And as time goes on, it only becomes more secure. Instead of the energy cost per hour being a million dollars, it may raise to $10 million in the future of energy power that take that is required to take down Bitcoin, okay? Now, the one other attack, the one other attack is called, well, one, a 51% attack but I didn't describe this fully. So a 51% attack is basically, let's say that we have the honest chain and it's building on the honest chain. All nodes, all nodes except the most worked chain. Okay, so what that means is the most amount of energy that has gone through SHA-256 is the chain that every node builds, builds on. This is the consensus rule that the nodes have to follow because otherwise they are de-incentivized to build on another chain, right? Let's just say that this chain right here is waiting for its next block. So we have chain A, chain B. The, the miners are not incentivized to build on chain B because it's going to cost them more money to actually try to catch up to A. Right? So all the miners will actually start mining on A. Now let's just say that an attacker, an attacker wanted to start building a new chain off of this one. Okay. So now both of these are competing with each other. And the attacker has to have a theoretical 51% to do this because the odds of the next block going to the attacker would be 51%. Okay. So the thing is, though, is that the attacker could start here and find the next block, but then this honest chain could also find a, a block very quickly. So you're going to have miners start building on these chains simultaneously. And as time goes on, one of these chains is going to win. Okay, but this is all to only double spend, only double spend the attacker's uh, transaction. You can't spend other people's transactions because you don't hold the private keys. They can only spend their transactions twice. So if they simultaneously committed a transaction like we were talking about earlier to, say, Charlie and Bob or themselves, then they would be able to record that in the attacker chain and they have to get ahead of the honest chain for it to be accepted. Now, once that happens, once that happens, if this is theoretically carried out, then yes, in theory, it could work, but only to spend, only to spend whatever transaction that you committed uh, fraud with at the cost of roughly a million dollars per hour, right? 
uh, it's not worth it. You're you're incentivized more to just build on the honest chain because then you could actually earn Bitcoin properly and have that true Bitcoin allocated to you. Okay. Now, if they don't have 51%, this honest chain is just going to outpace any attacker chain. So another fact of this in game theory and incentivization is the fact that um, a miner, a miner, if they successfully did carry out this attack right here, everybody is going to start to lose trust in the network. So if that happens, Bitcoin's value then also will drop significantly and they lose money in the end anyway. So there's really no point in an attacker carrying out this attack because they don't get any money out of it, realistically. Okay, so that is pretty much um, a blockchain in its entire regard. And um, there's one more thing I want to go over. So specifically this, all nodes except the longest chain or the most work chain. So let's say that chain A, chain B, and chain C, let's say that this one is in Asia, this one's in North America, and this one is in uh, uh, Europe. Okay, so because of distance between between uh, these real world physical locations, let's say that a miner in Asia happened to find a block, and so did North America, and so did Europe, all at the same time on the most work chain. You're gonna have what's called a chain split. So these are honest chains, they're, they're all the same worked chain. However, how do you solve which chain the nodes accept? Because if they all equal the same amount of work, the nodes have to accept either one of these chains. So the way you solve this is you just let it play out. You wait to see who gets the most, the next block. So in the case, let's say that B won uh, the next block, all of the miners mining on C are now going to start mining on B. Okay, so they're going to stop this, and then A is going to stop this, and then B becomes the ultimate chain. Okay, and that's pretty much the the how that is solved with battling for the true chain. Okay. Um. Oh yes, yes. One other last thing I do want to talk about blockchains is block size. So block size can make a network um, more decentralized or uh, more centralized. And the reason this is, is because let's say we have some block and this block size, there's only a specific amount of data that can go into this block in storage. Let's say the size of this block is one megabyte, okay? So I'll, I'll create a legend over here to help us understand. So we have one byte, right? One kilobyte uh, is a thousand bytes. So every time we go up, we increase by 1000. Then we have one megabyte, one gigabyte, one terabyte, one petabyte, and then one exabyte, okay? So every time we go up, this is 1,000, uh, times 1,000, okay? So one megabyte blocks, um, let's say that we have 100,000 users on the network, okay? So 100,000 users in Bitcoin, for example. That is going to produce 100,000 megabytes that have to be spread across the network, right? 100,000 megabytes have to be downloaded, so this is also equal to 100 gigabytes. Okay. Now, this is not an issue because every single node, each node downloads one megabyte. Okay. And if each node downloads one megabyte every roughly, roughly 10 minutes, and I'll explain the 10 minutes in a minute. Um, Roughly every 10 minutes, if they're downloading one megabyte, that is not an issue at all, okay? Um, however, however, if you turn this block, 
into a bigger size, now you have 100,000 gigabytes being propagated across the network and then 100 terabytes being downloaded in the world. Okay. So each, each node then has to download one gigabyte per 10 minutes. And this does not work because computers cannot communicate this data fast enough if the block size increases. So the only way that you could do this is if you had less nodes on the network. So if you had, say, 10 nodes in the world, well, that's only going to then be 10 gigabytes that is propagated across the network. And each node has to download one gigabyte within, say, 10 minutes. Because it's only 10 nodes that this has to be copied across, that is possibly doable, like one gigabyte per minute, okay? Now, you, with networking architecture, you are gonna have limitations, limitations of networking, architecture, and then you're also gonna have limitations of distance. So depending where these nodes are, if one node is in Asia and then one node is in North America, it's going to take a long time for even at the speed of light to communicate that data across the network, okay? So the reason I say that this is is because also, or in why block size pertains to centralization and decentralization, as you increase block size, you become more centralized. But as you decrease block size, you become decentralized. And here's why. So in Bitcoin's case, a block is added to the network around every 10 minutes, okay? And the theoretical average, or the theoretical max, block size max is four megabytes, but it averages, it averages normally around, I think 1.2 megabytes. But let's just say that it's around one megabyte average, okay? So for a consumer, for a consumer, if I wanna run a node, for me to download one megabyte every 10 minutes, that's pretty simple to do over time. And we can look at this mainly due to the fact that over 13 years, Bitcoin's block chain in storage is only around 430 gigabytes. 430 gigabytes over 13 years is not a ton. Uh, and so if we apply this to 130 years, we can say that in 130 years, we're gonna amount to roughly about 4.3 terabytes, right? Today, I can buy four terabytes of storage for around uh, 200 bucks for like an SSD, but then a four terabyte, um, for a four terabyte hard drive, just a normal hard drive, it's about maybe a hundred dollars. Okay, that is very affordable for a consumer to store that blockchain data. So as more and more users come on the network, because of Moore's law and computers becoming more efficient over time, the cost to run a node actually will go down. And because the block size is so small, it we can trust, we can trust that nodes will become cheaper over time to run and that many, many more users can run nodes. So over time, we may see 2 million users on Bitcoin's network and even more running Bitcoin's code, right? And this becomes very inexpensive over time due to Moore's law. But if you increase, if you increase the block size, then one gigabyte, one gigabyte per 10 minutes, right? Let's just say that instead of one megabyte, it was one gigabyte. Well, over 13 years, you would now have 130 terabytes. And then over 130 years, you would have um, 4.3 uh, petabytes. And in no way, in no shape or form, can anybody actually, as a consumer, afford that. Um, if you had a block 
of one gigabyte. So this is why I don't think blockchain applications are very useful for actually storing data because normal databases that we use are way more efficient at doing this, right? Google Photos, for example, is a database which holds tons of your photos uh, if you use them. But if you try to store photos in a blockchain, it's not possible for you to decentralize that across the world because the only people that can afford this amount of data storage is are people like Amazon and Google, right? They can store that amount of data, but consumers cannot. So this becomes centralized if you increase the block size, okay? I hope I explained that well enough for that regard. Now, let's talk about difficulty adjustment real quick. So we know, we know that in 2140, the year, the last Bitcoin will be mined. And this will be a very, very small fraction of Bitcoin, okay? Um, but roughly around every 10 minutes, Bitcoin reaches global settlement. And there is a reason to this, okay? So one reason is the fact that every 200 or 2016 blocks, Bitcoin changes difficulty. Okay. So how this works is it will average all of the time of the 216 blocks in this cycle. It will average the time and divide that by a denominator of a theoretical 10 minutes times 2016 blocks. So this will be a denominator of 20,160 minutes. Okay. So if, if the chain, if the chain is mining quicker, let's say that it's mining at 20,000, this is the average time that it took for the previous 2016 blocks, this is going to cause a number less than one, right? Because 20,000 over 20,160 is gonna be less than one. This is going to cause the difficulty to increase Okay, meaning it's going to take more hash power uh, to keep Bitcoin at around 10 minute settlement. Now, if this is the case where instead, let's say we had 21,000 minutes over 20,160, it's taking longer amount of time to actually mine blocks roughly every 10 minutes. So this will be a number above one which then Bitcoin will decrease difficulty to adjust for that, okay? So this is, the reason this is, is so we have a um, predictable, predictable supply, okay? So if we can predict that roughly every 10 minutes we have supply going into circulation, we can predict when exactly Bitcoin will be done mining, okay? Um, and this gives us a this gives us a good view of Bitcoin's economics too, because we know exactly how much Bitcoin will be produced in, say, a day, or a year, or we can estimate it at least very quickly. Versus gold, we don't really know uh, how much gold can come into supply in a day, a year, or whatever, and we don't even know how much gold there is, right? Um, so this makes Bitcoin due to its difficulty adjustment, there's no possible way that you can bring on hash power onto the network to mine Bitcoin quicker. You can only do that within a 2016 block time frame uh, because then it will increase in difficulty, okay? And roughly stay at this 10 minute settlement. And the reason that there is a 10 minute settlement roughly, Satoshi understood, uh, Let's talk about 10 minute settlement. Satoshi understood that 
it's possible that one day there may be millions of users running Bitcoin's code. So if we think about the world, if we think about Earth, right? Earth is pretty vast, right? You have a bunch of continents, and I know this is not the true Earth or anything, but anyway, let's just say that this is Asia, this is Europe, and this is uh, North America. Okay. For us to reach global settlement across each of these continents, because of networking architecture and the limitations that the speed of which data can be transferred, we have around a 10 minute settlement so that each, the entire globe can constantly uh, download this data efficiently and allow that time for all that data to be downloaded, okay? Because if there's millions of network users one day, it's very possible that, I mean, you're gonna get to a point where um, it, it's going to take definitely a lot, of, a lot of time in less than 10 minutes to propagate that data over the network where each node has to download that. So this is a very important thing in Bitcoin because this also makes it more decentralized. If we decrease this to one minute, right? It's possible, it's possible that every node across the world does not download the entire blockchain, right? So they have to play catch up, which then if they can never catch up to the uh, one minute settlement where blocks are settled every, every one minute, then you run into this issue where if, if you're a user at home and you don't have good internet connection or anything, then you may not be able to actually download the entire blockchain, so you're always behind, right? And if you can't download the entire blockchain, then you are not a valid user on the network because you have to be uh, fully up to date to be able to validate every transaction on the chain, okay? So when I think of certain, uh, certain things like an NTP time server, so network time protocol, all computers across the world normally use this type of NTP time server to keep track of where UTC is based on an atomic clock. Now, the computers that run this NTP time server, let's just say that there's 10 computers, right? Well, it's very easy for us to query that data from these 10 trusted computers, right? Because we can, we can easily contact 10 computers pretty easily within a certain time frame. Um, however, if you're trying to settle blockchain data, say of a, a few megabytes per one minute, or possibly, possibly, let's just say that this is settled every, uh, every like 10 seconds, right? Every 10 seconds, if I'm trying to download possibly five megabytes of data across the world, right? This really may not be possible. Uh, at all due to the limitations of just the laws of nature, but also distance and um, networking architecture. Speed of light can only be transferred at the speed of light, but due to networking infrastructure, it has to go slower than the speed of light to be able to transmit all of that data across the network, right? So if you drop this, you have to have, you have to have, if there's 10 second settlement, You have to have trusted computers in which you can contact to actually download all of that data efficiently. And this happens in the case of certain blockchains that do settle quickly this fast. You have centralized nodes which uh, allow users who run uh, these semi nodes uh, to be able to contact the entire network and query the blockchain, right? So you not actually having full nodes on the network, uh, which is a very important thing. Because if you can store your entire history of a blockchain yourself, then you can verifiably uh, prove that every transaction on your blockchain is true because you hold the entire data for that, right? There's all of that data integrity. So, 10 minute settlement is very important in Bitcoin's case. Um, this was not a bug, this is a feature. 
And I can't believe that people say that this is very slow because uh, the modern world in global settlement in banks, um, it takes around a month. So I'd say 10 minutes is pretty good. Okay. Now, overall, overall, that pretty much is how Bitcoin works, right? So these transactions will come in, the miners will take this unconfirmed block and they'll start hashing it. And then it will then be, once a valid solution is found, they'll propagate it on the network as a valid block. And everybody accepts the most work chain, okay? It's pretty simple, honestly. Um, and from the UI perspective, right, I just paid this invoice and I'm done. That's all I did. And as a merchant on the network, I can trust that after a certain amount of confirmations, let's just say that I want to be aware of a 51% attack, so I'm going to allow three confirmations until that is valid, so roughly 30 minutes. Then on global settlement terms in 30 minutes, that merchant can assure themselves that that transaction was not invalid, okay? And honestly, with certain things, like if you're buying a house, you can accept it on zero confirmations because what, it, what is a person going to do? Move a house? They can't do that, right? I can just go to the house and get the authorities to be like, hey, I paid you and then you invalidated the transaction somehow in some way using a 51% attack or whatever to buy this house. But the house can't move. So it's it's pretty easy to um, accept a transaction, something like that, on zero confirmations uh, versus, say, a good that's on wheels or something, right? So... Overall, that is how Bitcoin works from a technological side. It's hopefully I explained a lot of that well, um, and I just don't want that to go over people's heads. I mean, from a UI perspective, like I said, all I did was just type in a number, pay the QR code, and I'm done. And then this transaction appears in some of these blocks. The miners then start to mine these blocks, find a valid solution, and then that transaction gets included in the network. Now. I guess in terms of Bitcoin fees, the fee is set by the user, okay? And the fee can, right now, it's saying a median fee is 32 cents, right? But I can transact Bitcoin with two cents if I want to. It doesn't matter. So if I transact a larger amount of a fee, it the miners are incentivized to include that in the next block because then they get paid more money, right? But if my transaction is over here, Right, uh, one second. If this transaction is over here, like this, these people are paying three cents for a Bitcoin transaction. And overall, like they could be sending billions of dollars. It doesn't matter. Um, and overall, it's, it's just the way that Bitcoin works. The user gets to set the fee. Okay. And a block was just validated on the network. Okay. So... Once the miner then proposes a valid solution, they get 6.25 Bitcoin currently. Uh, and this is roughly mapping to $133,000. So I'll explain that next in our Bitcoin economics. Okay, so we just went through this entire Bitcoin transaction, how it works. Uh, and we can verify that it's true and it works out. Uh, and it's pretty easy to use, honestly. So... Let's get into some Bitcoin economics. And this is an example right here of a Bitcoin mining farm. Uh, I have only one of these little machines uh, versus companies that have uh, hundreds. So overall, I mean, Bitcoin mining can be done at home. It can be done in a company. It can be done anywhere, right? Uh, but let's talk about Bitcoin's economics, okay? So Bitcoin's economics is actually kind of interesting, right? So especially when you base this on difficulty adjustment, uh, speculators buy Bitcoin because they think it's going to go up and this will drive the price up to X amount of dollars. Miners then spend up to X amount of dollars of energy and hardware to try to mine Bitcoin. A high demand from buyers, meaning a lot of transactions on the network causes a rise in price and drives more miners to mine Bitcoin at some profit. More miners means more hash rate and more energy spent on Bitcoin production and the network gets even more secure. So this is a cool aspect of Bitcoin. As hash rate continues to go up, 
it makes the network more secure also. So buyers are reassured of Bitcoin security, sometimes leading to this feedback loop to drive the price even higher. So after 2016 blocks pass, we get this difficulty adjustment. Now a larger difficulty means a lower target number uh, that has to be reached and the miners are finding blocks less often, causing at least some of them to spend more than uh, X dollars in operating costs to mine uh, Bitcoin. So some miners then due to difficulty adjustment become unprofitable, spending more energy to mine than they can earn by selling the Bitcoin. Then they turn off the mining, the total hash rate drops. After another 2016 blocks pass, the difficulty is recomputed to become easier. Since some miners went offline, the target number is then raised. And a lower difficulty means that miners that were previously unprofitable come back online and mine or new miners can join the game. So currently right now, because Bitcoin's price is roughly around $20,000, there are mining companies that are becoming unprofitable because of how low it is. Uh, they are mining at energy cost uh, that is too high for them, so they eventually have to shut down, right? And depending on the Bitcoin mining efficiency that you have, if you're using a miner that takes up more energy than the efficiency of it, it's going to actually cost you based on your electricity cost. So there's some economics to that. So what about... What about the case when Bitcoin's uh, block reward ends? And let's talk about the block reward real quick. So if we go look at how many Bitcoins there are currently in existence, uh, there, I mean, technically there's always 21 million, but they just get minted out. Um, but 19,191,968.75 Bitcoin totally, is totally issued right now. Um, and then... Overall, there is 1.8 million left to be mined over the next uh, 100 something years up to the year uh, 2140, okay? We can estimate that there's roughly about 900 Bitcoins per day that are issued and 91% of Bitcoin has all been mined. Now, when we look at this in comparison to modeling uh, Bitcoin's monetary inflation, we're not right here, but we are right here currently where we have a 6.25 uh, block reward. Now, Bitcoin started out giving uh, giving Bitcoin at 50 Bitcoin per block, okay, for 210,000 blocks. So this is why Bitcoin's issuance, if you look at this logarithmic curve, it went very high. By, tw by 2012, there were roughly about uh, 10.5 million Bitcoin in existence already issued. And then over time, this block reward, every 210,000 blocks, which maps out to roughly about four years, after every four years, roughly, the block reward actually halves. This is in Bitcoin's code, okay? So it went to 25, then in, in 20... Uh, let's see, 2016, it went to 12.5. In 2020, it went to 6.25. And then in 2024, we can expect that it will go to 3.125. Now, this gives us predictable inflation and predictable supply. So currently right now, Bitcoin's uh, inflation rate, Bitcoin, Bitcoin's inflation rate is roughly sitting at 1.5 to 1.7 uh, inflation rate, okay? So this is going to continue on until 2024 in roughly about March or April that it halves again into an inflation rate of 0.82. And we can look over time that by the year, by the year 2100 or rather 2096, the inflation rate of Bitcoin is going to be 0 0.00002984. Very, very ridiculously low. So let's look at the economics of how Bitcoin is sound money. So if we go back to, <clears throat> not this uh, chart, uh, let's see, stock to flow value, okay. So we talked about stock to flow as an indicator of hardness of money. Okay, so gold roughly is still the hardest money that we know to this day because of the thousands of years that have uh, compiled uh, into the stock. Now, gold's inflation rate is roughly around the same as Bitcoin's right now. 
Uh, but our current stock to flow for Bitcoin is 55.3. And we can see that when Bitcoin started, the stock to flow was actually very, very low. The inflation rate was insanely high. And then it became basically the same thing as a commodity. But over time, over time, we can see that the stock to flow has increased immensely. And this is because of its predictable supply. So Bitcoin is currently sitting at 55.3. It's going to increase to 113 in 2024. And then it'll increase to 230 by the year 2028. So in the next happening in 2024, Bitcoin will be the most hard money we know in existence. And we know that Bitcoin can be money because it can it's proved itself a little bit to be a store of value. If you look at the comparison of Bitcoin since 2009 to every other uh, asset that you could hold, Bitcoin has been the one asset that has, one, it's been very volatile, but it's actually has the most value. Uh, and you can take any point, any point in Bitcoin's history and go back 210,000 blocks, so roughly four years, okay? You can take any point in Bitcoin's history and see that always the price of Bitcoin at that time versus the price of Bitcoin four years later has always been more, Okay. And this is in U.S. dollar terms, but if we think about it in Bitcoin's purchasing power, it's always gone up based on the stock-to-flow ratio, okay? So, overall, if a money becomes ultimately infinitely scarce because there's no more supply that comes in, we can expect that this money becomes the hardest money that we know of all time because it has absolute scarcity. And the reason I argue that Bitcoin is really the money for the digital age is because it is it is made for it it is completely decentralized and it can be sent instantly across the world from anywhere with no permission nothing that you have to give up identity for for an example anybody can go to my website which is public on the internet type in any number in here want to pay me some money and they can pay me in Bitcoin from anywhere in the world, right? That is insanely powerful. So we have this controlled supply, which we know that roughly we will get the last about amount of Bitcoin in the year. Uh, they're predicting October 8th, 2140. So the next, the next Bitcoin halving is in 510 days, roughly. Uh, and this will be estimated around March 22nd, 2024, currently with how Bitcoin is mining, okay? So, if we think of this, if Bitcoin's becoming a more scarce asset over time, normally, in a world of easy money, uh, every commodity or every thing that is tied to energy becomes more scarce, right? Because in a world of easy money, I can print an infinite amount of money to buy oil, right? But that's going to cause oil to become more scarce in that case. So when you tie money to energy, right, and we looked at the petrodollar, how the dollar has been tied to oil mostly, um, if you sever that tie or you have control of that money supply, then everything against that money becomes a lot cheaper if you're able to infinitely print it. Whereas Bitcoin is literally tied to energy, an encrypted energy, and you can think of it as digital energy, moving value across cyberspace uh, as digital energy. And that is very powerful because then you can trust that there is proof of work, the proof that the mining, uh, that the Bitcoin miners have put in to verify the energy that they put in to mine the Bitcoin that you own, okay? So if we look over time, too, of the what is called the HODL waves distribution, we can see that in this data, roughly data from 6 to 12 months of Bitcoin holders have not moved any of their Bitcoin, and that's 12% of all Bitcoin. 1 to 2 years, 20, 21% roughly. 2 to 3 years, 6.25. And if you add all of these numbers up, currently right now, we'll just do some quick math. 6.36 plus, um, move this all the way. Whoops. 
and 20.77. 66.07% of all Bitcoin has not moved from anybody's wallets. That is insanely powerful to think about because, because this means that people are even at $20,000 per Bitcoin, when it hits $69,000, people have not moved 66% of Bitcoin in over a year to 10 years time frame. Okay, that is crazy to think about. And then if you add on the six to 12 month, right? You add on the six to 12 month, this is 11.96, that's 78% of all Bitcoin in existence at Bitcoin's current price has not moved in six to six months to 10 years, over 10 years. That is proof that people believe that this is a store of value because over time, as you can see, Bitcoin's price ultimately has gone up and to the right, and I believe that it will continue to do so based on the stock to flow ratio and its scarcity, people are holding this as a store value. Uh, and we have the proof for that, okay? So overall, it's a cool thing to look at this chart too for Bitcoin's minimum transaction fee. Over time, it's sat around uh, mostly two cents or one cent. And currently right now, uh, it's, I mean, we just checked that I sent a Bitcoin transaction uh, with roughly two cents that I paid to send $10, and this is three cents, right? So ultimately, you can send any amount of money for three cents, and that is just based on how quick you want your uh, transaction to be verified, okay? So after the year 2140, though, okay, how do Bitcoin miners actually get... Um, get their uh, fees, right? So there's no reward after the year 2140. So we can expect that the only way Bitcoin miners will actually be profitable is based on transaction fees. And due to this, we can likely, likely if we want to keep the security of Bitcoin up, we can assume that Bitcoin at a layer one, at where it is right now, that this fee is likely going to be increase a lot more. So it may cost it may cost over hundreds of dollars to actually transmit Bitcoin. Now, you may be wondering, you're like, well, that's not going to work in a Bitcoin economic scenario. And yes, if we did not solve Bitcoin's scalability problem, then that would be possibly an issue. However, we have. And we will talk about the Lightning Network a little more in the next session. But Bitcoin has solved this issue of being able to transact Bitcoin uh, like cash with no fee as a medium of exchange because it needs to keep its value as you trade this good uh, with the Lightning Network. And Bitcoin currently transacts about, <clears throat> I think, seven to 10 transactions per second. The Lightning Network can theoretically do an unlimited amount of transactions per second. It's based on how many users are on the network, okay? So overall, we don't have this problem with the Lightning Network, but if we want to, say, verifiably transact um, <clears throat> important transactions uh, on the base layer one security, uh, we can do that still after the year 2140, uh, and we can think of it as a way of tax um, for using the network or anything like that. So it's very interesting when you just think of how the economics play out in the future. Uh, but ultimately, it does work as a model. So overall, there is this game theory and incentive with Bitcoin, right? The game theory is thinking, okay, right now, Bitcoin's market cap uh, is roughly around $400 billion, right? We've seen Bitcoin reach $1.2 trillion in market cap, and market cap is just the uh, total amount of money invested or shares across the network, basically uh, divided by the amount of coins that are possible, right? So if we think of the uh, theoretical Bitcoin uh, cost right now, this is how we can estimate its price 
So if it's four hundred billion dollars, I believe that's four hundred billion uh, million billion. Divide that by twenty one million. We can see roughly we get about what Bitcoin's price is currently nineteen thousand forty seven dollars. Okay, and it's probably slightly above this right now. Uh, so we'll just say four hundred twenty, so twenty thousand, right? But at a one point two trillion dollar market cap. That's where we got our Bitcoin being 58,000 and possibly even more when it hits 69,000. So roughly um, roughly 4. 1.445 okay. 1. trillion market cap was basically its max. Now gold's market cap is roughly 8 trillion, I believe. So if we put this in gold's perspective, that means to put Bitcoin at a four hundred two thousand dollar three hundred eighty price. Now, if if Bitcoin overtakes gold and it's stock to flow, right, and its inflation rate is actually lower than gold, it's more scarce than gold, and likely we are going to have to see Bitcoin will flip gold at some point. Okay, so if that puts Bitcoin at a four hundred two thousand dollar price, right, that is. If you're thinking long-term wealth, uh, just as an in investment standpoint, this is a very good trade. But I don't want you to think about it as a trade. I want you to think of this as a savings account, okay? If your money, realistically, money should be deflationary. Uh, and over time, your money should be more in purchasing power as time goes on, okay? And eventually, this will level out um, a lot more once... Bitcoin becomes a global reserve, which I believe it is very possible that it can. But overall, overall, we have to think about it in this this way, right? This is eight point four five trillion dollars. Okay, so the global wealth in the world is estimated to be roughly, right now, four hundred seventy trillion. Which means if Bitcoin became a global reserve currency it would need to be worth $22 million in US dollar terms today. Now, because fiat currency is always going to go to zero against Bitcoin, because it will inflate out of existence, this number in dollar terms will likely be a lot higher by that time. Um, but ultimately, this is generational wealth. I mean, this is a true savings account. If you just hold, like I said, at go back any point in Bitcoin and go back four years before, if you hold Bitcoin for a long-term perspective as a savings account, it will likely be worth more in the future, right? Even beating inflation, most likely, of your fiat currency, right? And that is something incredibly, incredibly powerful to think about because if you hold your money just in a bank account, and you have inflation being at currently 8%, but let's say a target 4%, the inflation is going to inflate your purchasing power out of existence, and it's not going to stay stable, right? So you could have $100,000 in your bank account, but you could be losing $8,000 every year, right? A purchasing power. So after 10 years, your money is practically worthless. It's $20,000 uh, in real terms. Okay, so overall, I just want to put that into perspective. And if even if even Bitcoin captures 5%, 5% of all global wealth, of all global wealth, $470 trillion, right? 5% of this is roughly going to map out to, I believe, what is it? Uh, not 12, I think it's... Yeah, it's about 22 trillion, I believe. Let's just use 25 trillion for easy numbers. That's going to put Bitcoin at 5% of all global wealth. At one over $1 million per coin in US dollar terms today. That is the game theory behind Bitcoin. Is that if you hold it as a savings account and use it as money, it is likely that as an early adopter you're going to get the price that, one, you deserve, but two, 
you are going to be able to provide for other people over time by truly not going into debt, but just long-term outlook and having that incentive of deflationary money, okay? If you can wait to buy that car, right, invest, investing the $4,000 you're going to put in to buy a car right now, and you wait to buy that car uh, that you don't necessarily need. Let's just say it's a, a Tesla and it's $30,000. You wait to buy that Tesla and put the $30,000 in Bitcoin instead. In four years, in four years likely, you will have made all of the money up to actually buy that Tesla by just saving in Bitcoin. Okay, and go 10 years down the road. Um, you will likely be able to afford maybe 10 Teslas, okay? So that's the reality of this in, in the game theory at play, is Bitcoin can be used as a vehicle for one generational wealth, a true savings account, and being able to provide for others unlike our fiat currency can today, which I believe gives society a much more productive outlook in the end. Okay. Now, acquiring Bitcoin, um, you can you can use this mantra of not your keys, not your coins, uh, right? If you don't control your private key, you do not own your Bitcoin at all, okay? So how can you actually acquire Bitcoin? Well, you can apply, uh, or you can get Bitcoin on exchanges, right? And exchanges such as Coinbase, I would not recommend at all because they own all of your Bitcoin. Now, they make it very convenient for you, but there's also fees involved and all that stuff. But you can also use decentralized exchanges, which I'm not going to go into the, the depths of that, but uh, for an example, one of them is local Bitcoins. And local Bitcoins allows you to buy Bitcoin without revealing your identity with other people around the world at a uh, agreed on exchange rate. Okay, And you can pay them over certain certain avenues like uh, a wire transfer stuff like that but overall that is a decentralized exchange and you can go look up videos on how to actually use them but remember if you use a centralized exchange if they go out of business then you will lose all your bitcoin there is no insurance for that and a great example of this is celsius okay celsius filed for chapter 11 bankruptcy because they were mismanaging people's money, loaning it out, and then eventually uh, they lost all of that money and then were not able to pay people back. And people lost millions and millions of dollars because they used a centralized exchange, right? The same thing can happen to Coinbase. Coinbase is not out of question here to go bankrupt, okay? So let's look at other ways you can acquire Bitcoin, okay? So you have exchanges, and the, I would recommend, uh, if you're going to go a centralized route, use Cash App or use Strike. Uh, currently, Strike can't operate in South Dakota, where I'm at, but you can use it uh, in other, other states for sure. But uh, overall, Cash App, I believe, is a really good one to go with, as they, uh, Jack Dorsey, being the head CEO of Block, uh, he actually believes in Bitcoin and works on Bitcoin himself, and they've integrated all of the cool things in Bitcoin on Cash App. They don't sell any other cryptocurrencies, just Bitcoin, okay? In person, uh, so you can exchange cash with somebody in person, and the only threat, the only threat to this is that, I mean, it's, it's possible just doing like cash deals in person. I, you have to be careful with the security of maybe they're, they could harm you or something like that. But overall, if they send the Bitcoin to you, uh, most everybody I've transacted with in person, or actually everybody I've transacted with in person, I've never had any problem. I mean, it's, it's, it's nice to know that because a lot of people who actually are in Bitcoin um, are very honest people. Now, we have also another mantra of saying, don't trust, verify. And overall, that is the mantra you should stick with. Do not trust people. Verify that everything about them uh, is true. So if you show up for this deal, then make sure that they are actually giving you the Bitcoin. Um, 
So then you have physical Bitcoin. Uh, now, physical Bitcoin, I don't actually mean that Bitcoin exists physically, but you can put it on devices and then give them to people. So OpenDime is a great example. On this OpenDime chip, you can put Bitcoin on here, right? And there's a public key with addresses that you can send this to, right? So there's this little hole that you can use a attack or um, some type of thing to just push through that hole. And it will then break a chip uh, on the device to then allow the private key to be revealed, okay? Now the private key will be revealed by the person who actually takes this open dime, the receiver of it. And when you plug it into a computer, you can verify that this has not been unlocked yet because it'll flash a green light. Now, a red light will be flashed if you, uh, if the private key has been exposed. And the reason this is important is because if the private key has been exposed and somebody else before you had this device, they might know the private key. So this is realistically a one-time use thing unless you absolutely trust the other person you are giving this to with physical Bitcoin and the receiver trusts you, okay? So that's that. But then you also have uh, a SATS card. So a SATS card is something where it operates just like an open dime. It works with NFC with your phone, but you can do the open dime exchange 10 times. There's 10 private keys on here that you're able to use. And overall, when you exchange a SATS card, um, that person can then lend it to someone else securely with a new private key and so on. Okay, so you can exchange these physically uh, and load Bitcoin onto these. Now, um, that's realistically physical Bitcoin. I can also give you a USB drive or an SD card or just something with a file on it that allows you to look at the private key, but you have to trust that I don't know that private key. And um, you could do this in person. You could make sure that they don't see the private key and that would work too, but overall that's physical Bitcoin in air quotes. You could be paid in Bitcoin. So on my website, for an example, anybody can pay me in Bitcoin, right? So if I if I provide a service to someone and they want to pay me in Bitcoin, I can say, hey, go to my website, just type in uh, the amount that I'm asking for uh, and then pay me. And then I can easily verify that they do that and it, there you go. So if I offer some service to somebody or a good that I'm trading with, they can pay me in Bitcoin that way, okay? So storing Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin wallets, uh, there's three different types. You have a custodial wallet, which is normally a centralized exchange. You want to avoid this. You do not want to keep your Bitcoin on an exchange. This is the worst thing you can do, because like I said, if they go bankrupt, they own your asset and they can choose to not give it back, okay? Or if they lost it, then you're out of luck. Now you have non-custodial wallet. These include Moon Wallet and Blue Wallet. These are wallets that are on your phone and a non-custodial wallet means that um, you're just using a wallet on somebody somebody else's Bitcoin node, which that is uh, provided for you, but they don't know your private keys at all. It's not possible for them to know your private keys, okay? Uh, so for you, you can trust that a non-custodial wallet is at least safer than an exchange, um, and these are actually very useful for transacting Bitcoin, uh, especially mobily. Now, if you want to use a desktop custodial wallet, you could use Electrum or you could use Sparrow. I love Sparrow a lot. It's a great Bitcoin wallet. Um, and they have a lot of functionality to them. And overall, you can even try to keep your privacy a lot more with these, okay? Then the last one uh, pertains to hardware wallets or running your own node, okay? So a hardware wallet is an example like cold card. This is the one I recommend. Uh, these are insanely secure devices and these can hold all of your Bitcoin on them because these devices hold the private key physically on the, on the chips here. Okay. And you can use these as your hardware wallet to be able to uh, use for transacting Bitcoin or any, any of that. Okay. Um, these are a little more complicated to learn. Uh, there are easier hardware wallets and cold card to learn, but I highly, highly recommend looking into cold cards and you can uh, actually look up videos on how to use them. There are plenty, plenty of videos, okay? Um, 
The last one is running a Bitcoin node. So you can run a Bitcoin node on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and these are a little more expensive right now because of supply chain issues. But I mean, I built my node originally for about $150 uh, altogether um, with a Raspberry Pi and then my SSD that I had. But these have also become more expensive because of supply chain issues. Um, but overall, you can build a node yourself or you can buy a pre-built one and roughly it's going to run you about $500, right? Now, if you run your own node, you have your own copy of the blockchain, you're running Bitcoin's code, and you have your own wallets and uh, Lightning wallets to work with. And we'll talk about Lightning more, like I said, in the next session. But overall, uh, you can buy these pre-built, okay? And these are a safe way to store your Bitcoin. The only, the only problem is that if you lose your wallet, or you lose your private key to that wallet, there is no way you can recover that, okay? If this computer died or something. But as long as you know the wallet or the private key um, or have a backup of the wallet, then you should be fine, okay? Uh, so overall, um, that is pretty much all I got. If you wanna get into Bitcoin mining, uh, this is another way you can obviously get Bitcoin uh, without any customer information or identity right through a centralized exchange you can buy one of these which these are some very powerful machines you would need a uh a 240 volt hookup to have to have this bitcoin miner at least but this is this used to be almost nine thousand dollars a year ago now it's two thousand three hundred dollars because these devices based on bitcoin's price going down are becoming less profitable based on the terahash per second that it produces so my bitcoin miner is this one um, and mine I bought originally f one year ago for about $400, but now it's roughly about $295. You can probably get it cheaper, but this one, if you don't, if you operate on, uh, electricity at a certain amount, it's actually unprofitable. And I'll show that to you here. Okay. So the S9, the Antminer S9, your break even electricity price is three cents per kilowatt hour, right? If I'm inputting what I have here at 10 cents per kilowatt hour, I'm actually operating at a negative dollar point eight two per day. However, me running the Bitcoin node, I get sats, which then I, this is the cool th game theory behind mining, is if I mine these sats and I just continue to hold them and I don't sell them and I operate at a current fiat negative, I can hope I can hope that Bitcoin will go up and I will have profitability one day. Now, this is nice for people that didn't take out loans to build Bitcoin businesses or Bitcoin mining businesses. But if you did take out loans, then obviously you can't pay, you can't pay your payments and you go out of business. Now, I also provide security to the network if I run a miner, right? Um, so I run my Bitcoin miner all the time and I earn Bitcoin roughly about this much per day. Um, but I currently, luckily, am operating at no, uh, no cost. Uh, for electricity, so this becomes very profitable for me at earning about a dollar a day, right? Um, now, if I had the other one that I showed you, I could be operating at seven dollars per day. Um, but with my electricity price, if I am paying like the electricity bill, um, then I'd operate at forty-four cents per day with this machine, which is a big, big machine, right? That was the other one I was showing. Okay, so pretty much that is all I have for the Bitcoin economics and technology. I know that this was very long, but I wanted to explain things very thoroughly, and this can be broken up. You don't have to watch all of this uh, in the same sitting, but uh, overall, that's all I have. And if you have questions, please feel free to email me uh, or uh, you can go to my website and I have my email down here and I have my discord down here so you can message me as well. Okay. So with that, that is all I have. Uh, and I thank you so much for taking the time to view this next week or in the next session, we will be going over the fear, uncertainty and doubt around Bitcoin media headlines, macro outlook of the economy, uh, over the years. And also, um, a big argument on proof of work versus proof of stake. Okay. 
So why Bitcoin energy use is actually good for the environment. Uh, so anyway, that's all I got. And thank you for watching this.